Do you know what time it is? It's 10 04. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode for Bio 116 Lab. Today we're going to be talking about cream jellies. Scientifically, the group has been used to not for us. Sila yung mga madalas nating napagkakamalang jellies. They look very, very similar. They kind of have that see through jelly like consistency going on. But there will be a few main differences from the group. And here are just a few of the defining characteristics of tenofurin. Anytime you hear the prefix teno or tene or tenna, that quite literally translates to comb, as in comb. Running longitudinally along their bodies would be rows of cilia that kind of look like combs. And these are what they use to move. So they don't have the whole skyphozoan, like undulating, like jet propulsion bell thing going on. It's what they mainly use to move is the, these, these cilia that they beat frantically. Quite frankly, if you're in the ocean being carried by a current or a wave, that really doesn't do much, but at least they try. They also exhibit what we call bioluminescence. Now, this is not to be mistaken for iridescence. That's quite different. When you swim in the ocean during daytime and you see a comb jelly, and then you observe the beating cilia, you see that rainbow shimmering thingy going on. Oh wow, it's bioluminescence. It's not. That is iridescence. That's just kind of how the light scatters when it hits the cilia of your tenophore. Bioluminescence is when the organism itself has certain proteins or is able to have this chemical reaction that actually produces light from within the organism. Oi. Glowing ka ngayon, ah. Yung sa kanya mismo nang gagaling yung ilaw, that is what we call bioluminescence. When you agitate the water at night, makikita mo na parang nag-glow yung tubig na parang, Oh my god, may alitap-tap yung tubig! Nakakatawa. Aside from having the distinct tenae or the rows of cilia, if cnidarians have nidocytes, what tenophorans have instead to help capture their prey would be coleoblasts. They don't sting. Instead, they kind of work like sticky suction cups. <coughs> And then, yeah, they capture the prey. And the coleoblasts are found along their tentacles, which for the most part are retractile. Parang nuku ng pusa, di ba natatago nila? For tenophorans that do have tentacles, pwede din nila itago yung tentacles. And then kapag kailangan na nila, siya. They exhibit radial symmetry, but in their case, it's biradial, which means it's just along two axes that they really do exhibit some sort of symmetry. Similar to cnidarians, is they do have the end where the mouth is, and then there's also the end where, of course, the mouth is not. Where the mouth is not, which is the aboral end, you will find some sort of like gravity sensing body, which we call again a statolith. Something that they also share with cnidarians. The statolith in cnidarians would be found in their. Ropalia. Remember that? If you're wondering how they swim, in what direction does it go? It travels mouth first. So the cilia would beat in the direction such that it pushes the tenophoran through the water mouth first. If you're trying to get food, it happens to be along your path like, oh, okay, yay, kumain na tayo. For the major classes for this phylum, you have class Tentaculata, and you also have class Nuda. One class has tentacles, one does not have tentacles. That's it. But why are tenophorans important? They're either predators, again, or they're prey, so they're very much part of the food web. Everybody is part of the food web. Every living organism at some point is either eating something or being eaten. They also serve some sort of bioindication role. Why are there so many tentacles in the water? That could be because there is something going on in the water that is allowing them to reproduce a lot more quickly. We keep talking about being in the water. At some point, you will be in the water, maybe because you love the ocean. Maybe you're going on that vacay with your family or friends. Well, typical boat tours, you know, island hopping tours. Diba dadaling kayo doon? Baba po tayo dito. So you, you just get off the boat, right? You don't really have the time to peer into the water and say, Hey, is there anything in the water? No, you just jump in. And sometimes when you jump in, you're like, surprise! Then of course, sabi nga natin, napapagkamalan silang jellies. You're like, oh shit! There's that, that, that instant panic that it could be a jelly. And for good reason, because it really could be a jelly, you could get stung. But if it's a box jelly, you could actually die from that. Education is very much important. If you know it's a tenophore, you know it's not going to sting you. And that could be a nice conversation piece for somebody else who's panicking in the water. Relax! Oh my god, it's a jelly, jelly! Relax! It's just a tenophore. And I leave you with a few practical tips on how to enjoy your next adventure with not just tenophorans, but peripherans and cnidarians as well. For anything that you see in the water, please do not touch or chase or just don't harass them. No! God! Unless, of course, it's for the sake of science. If you're gathering samples, fine. But try to keep everything to a minimum. We just, as much as possible, we want to appreciate them from afar. Let them do their thing. Don't step on the corals. I could not stress this enough. Please. Hey! Hindi po sila bato. They're actually very much alive. And so, what happens if you happen to be swimming and you suddenly get tired? Float.
seawater is a lot denser than fresh water. That makes it easier for you to float. If you're wearing a snorkel, you could just suddenly stop swimming and just float. If you don't have a snorkel, if you don't have anything to do, then float on your back. Please don't step on them when you're tired, when you're like, la, 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 tayo. Diba? Tapos, mag kayo ng mask. Ay, nakita niya yun, ng coral. Tapos, oh, please don't do that as much as possible. If you are not confident in the water and there is an option to wear a life vest, then go for it. Wear it. It's not, you know, a matter of pride. But if you're pretty confident in your swimming skills, just avoid having your fins or having your feet touch the sand or touch the corals, God forbid. It really takes a lot of time for our reefs to grow, like thousands of years, hundreds of years. And then all of a sudden, sisipain mo lang, basag na. As much as possible, keep your movements very minimal, graceful, and just deliberate. Like when I say deliberate, if you want to go that way, then just use the smallest amount of movement to get to where you want to go to in the water. What kayong big movements, big splashing, because who knows what you will attract or what you will repel. And if you don't have to move around so much, don't. Inhale, exhale, you're just gonna rise and fall a little bit with the water. You'd be surprised how much the ocean will just keep you afloat. You don't even have to do anything. If you do happen to be in a tour and you notice that the boatmen, they kind of just drop anchor anywhere, if you can tell your boatman, oh yeah, parang coral siyata yung inaanklahan ninyo. You're anchoring on coral. Just don't go on that tour again. Let's not support tourism enterprises that are very ungrateful for the creatures that actually give them their livelihood or their jobs. If you're in the water, hey, you see some trash, pick it up. Unless you notice that there is already an organism living in it. Pa minsan kasi di ba may glass bottles, you know, you're like, oy, basura to, let's pick it up, let's clean the ocean, right? Pero pag uh, sinilip mo, pa minsan may nakatira na pala sa loob. There's a little fish inside or whatever organism is already taking residence inside that piece of trash. I guess you're just gonna have to leave it alone. Just don't disturb it. And of course, if you're not sure kung basura ba siya or hindi, don't pick it up. There are some things in the ocean that look like trash, but they're actually alive. In the same way, there are trash in the ocean that look like animals. Let's also be aware of that. So yeah, speaking of trash that look like animals, what is this? So Aurelia Gaya Gaya, it's a plastic bag. A lot of the things that we throw, kahit na sabi mo tinapo mo siya sa basurahan, sa tamang lugar, you wouldn't be surprised how much of our trash just ends up in the ocean and inadvertently gets accidentally consumed by other animals. For the most part, they break down into what we call microplastics. And that also causes a lot of problems, not just for the animals in the water, but for us. Because again, smaller animals eat the microplastics, which are eaten by fish that increasingly grow in size, and then we eat the big fish. So hey, the plastics just came back to us. Kung ano yung basurang itinapon mo, ibabalik lang ng dagat sa'yo. A lot of the pollution that we're actually throwing into the ocean, whether intentionally or not, yep, it kind of comes back to us in so many different ways. In terms of tourism, basura yung mga beaches mo, nobody's gonna go there. And so you lose your jobs, you lose your livelihoods. It's up to us in a way to just have stewardship over the places that were entrusted to us. Not just for us, but let's also try to think of these other animals that we're sharing the planet with. They're very innocent. They have nothing to do with all of the shit that we're doing. And then suddenly they're the ones that suffer the greatest consequences for the things that we do. And just try to put yourself in their position. Like, how would they feel? And this is not just for these first three phyla that we've discussed, but for the rest of marine life that you'll see. No, I'm not thinking about saving the planet. That's, that's, I can't do that. And neither can you. If you can't do the superhero thing, which is to save the planet, then the least you could do is just to not be a bother to anybody else. Diba? Hindi mo na lang din kayang tulungan. Eh, di wag ka na lang mang abala. What is your opinion on, on the whole thing about, like, buying sustainable products? But what are you gonna do with the rest of the crap in your house that you replace that sustainable crap with? If you buy another thing, then you've just, again, created more waste. The best way to be sustainable is just to use what you have right now to its fullest lifespan until it breaks down and you really cannot use it and you can't even fix it. Do we really need a lot of the things that we buy? Because every time we consume something, that produces trash. Live simply so that others may simply live. I hope you all had fun learning about sponges, algarines, chitons. The next leg of invertebrate zoology, we'll be learning about worms and many different kinds of worms. Flatworms, roundworms, segmented worms. That will be the next chapters of our adventure. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye. Reusable straws. You're a grown-ass person. Do you, do you honestly need a straw for your drink? What are you, a baby? What are you, a child? I'm sure there are people who legitimately need straws to drink fluids. Then fine, go use that. If you're saying, oh, I have lipstick on and shit. Well, f that. You don't need it. You don't need these straws, plastic or non-plastic. It's a fucking cup. Glug, glug, glug. Wow. Is that so difficult?